Perfect. So hello, everyone. I'm Mats Esseldeus, and welcome to my presentation that is on the tidal dissipation in cool evolved stars. Um, so let me start my story with an observation. Uh, here on the left, you can see an observation of the outflow uh, of the HB star R. Achille. It's uh, one of the atomium um, stars one of, on the atomium postcard you've already heard about um, in other presentations during the conference. But what you can see is that there's clearly some structures within this outflow. Um, and it's not spherically symmetric. And on the right, you have a simulation, a simulation done by Olin Malfe of a triple system with an HB star uh, in where she tried to reproduce the morphological structures we see in this, uh, in this HB star. Now, she already talked about this simulation during her presentation, so I'll not go into detail further. Um, but what I am interested in, in particular, is this triple system, or more, more easily, a binary system. A binary system with um, an AGB star, and uh, more specifically, the orbital properties of such systems. What is a typical mass of a primary star, of a companion star? How far away are they from each other? Or uh, in combination with this, what is the orbital period? As well as what is the eccentricity? And we don't really have a lot of direct observations um, of close by companions to HB stars. So it's difficult or it's not really possible to do some statistics to see which part of the parameter space is filled and which part is not. So what we can do is some orbital evolution calculations to see how the, these properties um, of, a, of an orbit with uh, an AGB star changes throughout time, throughout the lifetime of the HP phase. And what we can do at the end to validate if our predictions are true is look at later phases of evolution or binary properties, um, by orbital properties of binaries with one star in an evolutionary phase later than the HP phase. And this is exactly what can be seen in this period eccentricity diagram here. That's already been well explained by Kasper in an earlier talk as well. But let me reiterate, you have such or binary properties, periods and eccentricities of such systems um, by the points in the, um, in the diagram. And in the background, you have um, population synthesis calculations where we predict that there is a bimodal distribution uh, in terms of the orbital periods, um, as well as, to me, even more interesting is the fact that we predict that there is no uh, eccentricity for periods that are lower than about 10 years. So everything should be circularized below this point. And this is not what we find in observations. In observations, we see that there is actually a significant eccentricity for orbital periods lower than this 10 years. So this can mean two things. Either there's something pumping up the eccentricity throughout the HB phase, such that the eccentricity can remain high during this phase, or we're looking at tides or the, the calculations we use for tides, tides might not be extremely adequate for the evolved phases. Since what we use for tides at the moment is uh, parameterized or parameterized equations that are calibrated mainly on the main sequence. So for that reason, I delved um, into the, the, the literature of tidal dissipation and it actually turns out there are more or multiple uh, dissipation mechanisms multiple tidal dissipation mechanisms, where the first one is the equilibrium tide. And the equilibrium tide is a tidal dissipation mechanism we think about when we think about tides. You have a primary object, for instance, a giant star, and you have a companion that is orbiting around it. Uh, and due to the gravitational pull of this companion, there will be a bulge created in or on the primary star. And this bulge, due to friction, is actually lacking behind the line of sight of the companion, and because of this time lag, there is a torque um, acted from this bulge onto uh, the companion. And this creates dissipation, this creates a coupling between energy and angular momentum of the spin of the star um, and the orbit with the companion. Now, this is not the only mechanism. You also have the dynamical tides, where the dynamical tide is a coupling between pulsations, uh, between pulsations and the orbit. Since your tidal bulge from the equilibrium tide is moving at such a specific period, such specific frequency, the tidal frequency, at this frequency, waves can be launched and sometimes even modes can be created um, 
allowing for additional transfer of energy and angular moment. And this dynamical tide has always uh, or has never been uh, evaluated along the evolved phases. It's always been neglected um, as um, neglected, thought to be small compared to the equilibrium tide in these phases. And as I said before, the equilibrium tide has always been uh, parameterized equations calibrated mainly on the main sequence. So these, to see if these assumptions are true, I calculated uh, some stellar evolutionary models. Uh, I calculated 10 of them with an initial mass um, between one and four solar masses. I started from the pre-main sequence and I evolved them all the way uh, until they cool down to become a white dwarf. And what do I get from these stellar evolution computations? I get the internal structure as a function of stellar age. So on the diagram here on the right, I indicate where the convective regions are and the radiative regions are throughout stellar evolution. On the x-axis is stellar age. Up to the stellar age, the star is cooled down as a white dwarf. So the, um, the time where its luminosity reaches 10 to the minus one, where I terminate my simulation. And why do I do this? This allows me um, to indicate on one diagram all the different late stellar evolutionary phases, uh, like we have the main sequence here, the RGB here, then the horizontal branch, the asymptotic giant branch, and then where it cools down to become a white dwarf. And when we have this internal structure, we can use all of this information to start calculating the tides. And that's what I do in the image here on the left. I start from ab initio, uh, knowledge we have to really calculate the tidal dissipation, the equilibrium tidal dissipation, instead of working with parameterized equations. So here you have the same stellar age on the x-axis and this time period on the y-axis and the color scheme indicates um, the tidal love number. And this love number is a metric for how strong tides are. So a high value is strong tides and a low value is weak tides. And you can see that in terms of orbital period, this remains rather constant, but it changes a lot depending on your orbital, uh, on your uh, stellar age. So when the star increases in size and becomes huge or giant in size, uh, the tidal dissipation strength uh, strengthens. Uh, and you have a lot of dissipation during the RGB as well as the HP. This is not the case anymore when you go to the dynamical tide. In the dynamical tide, there is a strong dependence on orbital period, as this um, allows for, um, for waves at different frequencies, uh, where you have strong tides at low orbital periods and weaker tides at larger orbital periods. And also it doesn't really increase anymore when you increase the stellar radius. At some point it even decreases. So during the RGB and the AGB, it will be less uh, significant. So now that we have the equilibrium and the dynamical tide, sorry, this dynamical tide, I should note, is a dynamical tide from gravity waves. Gravity waves are waves that can travel in the radiative zone of the stars, in the radiative core of the giant phases uh, in this case. So now we have equilibrium and dynamical tides. We can divide the two and see in which part of the, the, um, of the parameters page space which type of tide is dominant. And then you get an image like here on the left, um, where red indicates the, uh, the dynamical tide being dominant and blue indicates the red being, um, blue indicates the equilibrium tide being dominant. Where you can see that for low period companions during the main sequence, as well as the red giant branch, the dynamical tide um, is dominant and it still has some relevance during the, the horizontal branch. But when the star is giant in size during the RGB, as well as the AGB, it's the equilibrium tide that dominates. And I didn't only do this for the one solar mass model, I did it for all the 10 of the models. So let me show you the other extreme, the four solar mass model. Um, this diagram looks similar, but not exactly the same. We still have, um, we still have dominance during the main sequence for short orbital periods and dominance um, during the horizontal branch. But when the star is giant in size, it's again the equilibrium tide that dominates. And this entire story on how you can start from the internal structure um, to calculate the tidal dissipation strengths uh, and which factors play an important role in which type of tides, I combined in a paper I wrote that has been submitted uh, and is currently under review. But now that we have our mechanisms and if we, ha we have our formalisms, we can start to calculate the tidal dissipation. So we can start 
to see what happens um, to the eccentricity, how the eccentricity changes when we apply these tides and the orbital evolution. And here I took um, as a preliminary computation, I took a so two solar mass initial mass model. I added a one solar mass companion and an orbit, I think of 15 years, an eccentricity just above six, just to see what's happening. Um, and I show here the orbital evolution during the HB phase. Why the HB phase? Because in the rest of the phases, the circularization for this companion is not sufficiently strong to actually circularize. And what do I plot in green and in orange? It's two different parameterized equations that are used in literature. Um, in blue is my computations, but then for an equation that assumes that you have a sufficiently low eccentricity or quite a low eccentricity, which is not always extremely correct. So I also indicated the full computation in red. And you can see that throughout the HB phase before the thermal pulses start, also not a lot is happening. So let me zoom in on the thermal pulse phases um, where things start, start to change. Let's start with the green and the orange line. The green and the orange line, they're clearly a little bit different. And the main difference is the strength that they put in. It's a prefactor that can be altered and is tuned um, mainly on main sequence stars. Um, and you can see that, well, they differ quite a lot. So there's still a lot of uncertainty and a lot of, um, the, or, yeah, a lot of uncertainty coming from these parameterized equations. And if you take the low eccentricity computation I did with my title, title calculations, the blue line, it falls in the middle of those two. So if this would be the ground truth, well, maybe our, um, our parameterized equations are not so bad. But what we need to do is take all the terms into account which gives us the red curve. And the red curve already starts circularizing earlier on in stellar evolution, but, um, but it becomes more gradual throughout, um, throughout time with lower eccentricity. Um, but they all still end up with quite a circular orbit with quite low eccentricities. And if you might remember, I went looking for ways to keep the eccentricity high um, such that we don't circularize. So that goal has not been reached with the tidal computations um, or the revision of the tidal computations I did. But, um, and this means that there needs to be an additional mechanism um, to pump up the eccentricity, but it doesn't necessarily has to be something else than tides because tides can pump up the eccentricity as well. Um, this is a, a study done by Senedal and it's on completely different stars with completely different orbits. So it's about around a main sequence star with orbital periods here. The numbers above indicates the orbital period in days. So it's quite short period um, binaries. And it computes the tidal dissipation or the circularization together with the pulsations in the main sequence star. And what they actually found is if you have modes that are triggered inside the star um, in, inside the star automatically. And you have a dynamic or a tide and the dynamical tide is able to lock into or tap into this energy reservoir of the pulsation that is already occurring. Then you can have, instead of circularization, pump of the eccentricity as well. And that's indicated in this image where in, in orange they have circularization and in blue they have pumping up of the eccentricity. So it can be quite significant um, it can be quite significant in some parts of the parameter space. Um, and we don't have short orbital periods uh, of five days and we don't have main sequence stars, but what we do have is pulsations. We see pulsations in AGB stars that are on, um, that have a period that is not so much uh, or not so far away from the orbital periods we observe uh, for such systems. So it might be possible that um, the, the, the eccentricity is pumped up due to energy that comes from these pulsations. But this still is, um, well, not investigated as of yet, so it's still a hypothesis. And that brings me to my conclusions. The tidal dissipation um, can be calculated up in itio throughout the entire lifetime of the star. And when looking at the dynamical tide and the equilibrium tide, the dynamical tide of the gravity waves remains quite moderate compared to the equilibrium tide during the giant phases. And when we use these computations to see what happens to the eccentricity, well, sadly, our eccentricity problem is not solved yet. 
So we need eccentricity pumping, but this can still come from tides as um, the dynamical tides connecting with pressure modes, these modes we see um, in AGB stars. They still can uh, be studied to see if this can cause eccentricity pumping. Uh, thank you for your attention, and I will be glad to answer some questions. Uh, thank you. This is really uh, excellent work and uh, very interesting to me in trying to understand this uh, interesting um, objects with eccentricities that are so high. Um, can you, uh, so the, the boundary between the thermally pulsating AGB and the post-AGB, it's kind of a bit uh, fluctuating, right? Depends on how mass loss and, and so all you need is to anticipate a little bit in your models the transition that you would end up with a higher eccentricity. So if you take that gray line that this divides in your one of your um, slides, yeah, here, you take the gray line back a little bit, uh, you would be left with a higher eccentricity in the, in the post-AGB phase. So how much can you take that line back by, for example, pumping up the mass loss rate? I mean, we know that this transition moment is not very well defined. Uh, yes. Um, so the, the, the strength of the tide, uh, as it's mostly the equilibrium tide, um, is mostly from the fact that you have a, a, a giant star. So indeed, if you increase the mass loss, then the star will reach less um, large radii. So your dissipation will be less. So you can shift indeed the line a little bit uh, to the left. But since we have the, the red curve we need to follow, it's not a sharp transition anymore, I think. Um, so since you start circularizing earlier, if you shift the line, the eccentricity will be changed uh, a little less than we thought earlier. Um, how much this line can change, I would need to twiggle <laughs> with the numbers. I don't really have a good feeling for this uh, myself. Um, but in principle, yes, it can be tweaked a little bit um, to get some higher eccentricity. Not enough. And, and just a very quick other question is, so MESA uses itself prescriptions for tides. It's not an ab initio calculation. It's somebody's equations. Yes. Wh wh whose equations are they? And for both the equilibrium and, uh, and uh, dynamical tides? So the equations used in MESA itself is only the equilibrium tide. And I think it's the HUD prescription, but I am not sure. Um, which basically comes down to um, something like these equations, um, but just a slightly different um, prefactor, um, in a sense. Uh, thanks, Mats, for the nice talk. I'm curious, in the tidal computations, how have you taken the mass loss into account and like what mass losses have you used? Um, so I just took a prescription for the massless to, to compute the, the stellar evolution. And in the tides itself, I have not um, yet taken into account the massless. Um, this can have an effect. How strong this effect is, is, is a bit hard to quantify if you don't really do the calculations uh, thoroughly. So I've not yet included it. Um, and to my knowledge, it's not really been included in um, tidal computations um, as of now as well. So it would be a completely new um, computation to do. Uh, 